shall reign forevermore, Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords.
Father, to come into your presence. And I've heard a thousand stories of what they think your life, but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're
makes her the chip right here. Not that Tenchi hasn't been, but there's a title and there's something that goes along with it. So we want to recognize the achievement and it seemed like it would be good. So Kara, would you come? And Jeff, would you come? And, and family, I've asked uh, Pastor Stan and Julia, if you are available, would you come? And if you're on the board and you're present today, would you please come? There's at least one more member that's watching at home. You'll have to just pray hard, then it makes it all the way here. And I think there's a little question about that. Is that Rick? Yes. It is Rick, yeah. Praise God. Uh, hi, Rick. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a big deal. Somebody got a camera somewhere? I'm not sure. Yes, I see that camera. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Chan. Let's, let's smile for the camera because this is a moment. Thank you for being here today. This is a great day. We're celebrating. Yeah. So we want to pray. This is a big deal. So we want to pray and ask God a blessing. And uh, I'm going to, there's a couple things that happen. I'm going to pray and
Jesus. In your name, we say yes to this ordination. Yes, and amen. 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 amen.
device. Um, will you open with me to the book of, um, we're going to go to Matthew. And um, so we have a couple, couple things up here. You can go ahead and start them, Tom. Um, 2020 has been a year, right? <laughs> this says, time traveler, what year is it? Me, 2020, time traveler. Oh, that's not where I wanted to be. And what's the next? <laughs> 2020. Oops. No, you can go back, please. 2020. Every second. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Just when we thought it was crazy, it gets crazier. And it's been a crazy year for the world, and it's impacted all of us. But 2020 doesn't change the power of the Christmas story and why it matters so much. Um, Billy Graham said it well. He said, Christmas is not a myth. It's not a tradition. It's not a dream. It's a glorious reality. So this morning I want to highlight four character scenarios that were in the books of Luke and Matthew in regards to this glorious reality of the Christmas story. Okay, we can go to the next one. I think, am I cutting out? Is it just me? Okay. Is it, can you? Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll try not. Okay. All right. I'll try not to touch it. Um, so the first story that we want to highlight is the story of Mary. And um, I'm going to read in, uh, in Luke. Verse 26, and it's from the NLT, and it says, is this, should I switch microphones? Okay. It really wouldn't be Christmas if there wasn't technical difficulties. <laughs> I feel like that's just kind of how it goes, right? Okay. <laughs> oh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> that, I didn't know that was prophetic. I just thought that was fun meme. Um, okay, so there are four character scenarios that were given in the books of Luke and Matthew that I would like to highlight um, and about the glorious reality of Christmas. And I just want to start with Mary. We are all pretty familiar with Mary, and most theologians believe that she was around 15 to 16 years old when the angel Gabriel came to her 
she kind of had all her ducks in a row for that time period. She was betrothed to Joseph. She had a pretty good idea of the trajectory of her life. And then Gabriel shows up. And so buckle up for a minute because we're going to read this. It's, um, it starts in 26. I'm going to be reading from the NLT, and we're going to go to 41. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God, which is her cousin, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to mar be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, and he will be very great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestors, David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. But Mary asked the angel, how could this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age and is now in her sixth month. For the word of the Lord will never fail. Can you just say that with me? For the word of the Lord will never fail. One more time. For the word of the Lord will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. And at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child wept, leapt within her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And we read through verse 41 because I think it is so important and amazing that the first person who recognized Jesus was an unborn child. And I just want to make that amazing just declare, declaration that babies in the womb are fully capable of feeling the presence of God. And that is so such a valuable place. It's not just about someone choosing something. It's about knowing that life is created in the image of God. So the first point I would like to make is Mary did not hesitate to allow God to redirect her life for his glory and she trusted him with the fallout, with the details. Um, let's go to the next. Can we go to the next slide, please? I put this in because if you've ever seen Frozen, and for those of you that don't have girls, maybe you've never seen Frozen, but literally there's a song in there, and she just sings about letting it go. And if you're someone that kind of has your life together, or, you know, sometimes we feel like we're on a good path, and the Lord just comes to us, and he's like, hey, this is kind of what I see. This is my plan. This is what I want to birth through you. We sort of overthink it a lot of times. Maybe I'll speak for myself on this. And I felt like this was so appropriate because Mary's response was, yes, Lord, exactly as you've said, let it be done. My response would probably be like, Lord, one does not simply let it go. Like I had plans, I had ideas. But Mary was willing to trust what the Lord had told her, even though it was going to cost her her reputation and potentially her betrothal, her engagement. My question to us today is, are we willing to trust the Lord with the merry miracle that he wants to do in each of our lives through birthing something great? Because here's the thing. Mary went to Joseph, and I love this. I was thinking about this. I am married to an incredible man, and I can trust him with true stories that are awkward moments. Does anyone have people in their lives like that? Uh, Jeff's like, how's your day? And I'll be like, you won't believe what happened. And then he was like, okay, well, I didn't need to know that. <laughs> but Mary trusted Joseph. She trusted him enough to tell him the truth that the Lord had told her that the Holy Spirit was going to conceive a child. And then she trusted the Lord enough to work out the details with Joseph. And I think that's really cool. When the Lord puts something in our heart that he wants to birth, we need to say, okay, Lord, I trust you. And the people closest to our lives, we need to say, Lord, I trust you that you are going to tell them how that's going to work and you're going to handle the fallout. You're going to handle all the details. Because then the angel Gabriel comes to Joseph and tells him he's a good man 
and to take Mary and that she's telling the truth, but that there can be no hanky-panky until after Jesus is born. And you know what? God trusted Joseph to protect Mary and to honor God's word. That's important. We need to be people who, when the Lord says, this is what I'm going to do in your life, the people that are closest to us are people that will protect the word that God has given to us. So because of the Romans and the census they, the, they demanded be taken, Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem on a donkey. Mary is nine months pregnant. For those of you men who haven't been nine months pregnant, <laughs> Jeff has been passing a kidney stone. He refers to it as a man pregnant. So apparently everyone in the medical industry was like, oh, it's like having a child, but instead of taking a baby home, you get to take home this tiny rock. It's really not as exciting. But being pregnant at nine months on a donkey, just, it sounds terrible. I just had to throw that in as someone who's been pregnant, sitting on a donkey for nine months, for nine months, wow, for four days at nine months is not fun. So they get to Bethlehem, everything is crazy booked, and they can't find anywhere except the stable to stay. And that is where Mary gives birth to Jesus. So here's a 15 or 16-year-old girl birthing her first child in a barn because she trusts God's word. So it doesn't look anything like she probably had in mind. She was going to have this great wedding with Joseph. They were going to build a home together. It was a hard life already because it was in the midst of Roman times. And God comes and he's like, this is the miracle I'm going to birth in you. And it's going to start in a barn. Shepherds were nearby watching their sheep. And according to the research I've done, shepherding at this time in history was considered a bottom rung job. It was down there with dung collecting, which I didn't know was a job, <laughs> and tax collecting, which is ironic that those two are on the bottom rung, dung and tax collecting. <laughs> so the shepherds were not cool people, and they were really not even acknowledged as by society. At this point in Roman history, from everything I've researched, it was actually outlawed to do any kind of shepherding except in the desert hills. So they were sort of um, banished in a way. And that's where we pick up in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 20. That night, there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined with a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And when the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and that the angel had said to them about the child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart. And the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. And it was just as the angel had told them. And I feel like this is such a valid point that's on the Lord's heart this morning. If you feel invisible today, God wants you to know his heart is peace and goodwill toward every one of us. And that Jesus the Messiah is born. The shepherds were in a place of basic banishment. In fact, it was illegal to sell sheep at this point in Roman history because they were considered stolen. So the shepherds were just out watching their flocks. They didn't get to interact with a lot of people. It was a very, it was a very hard life. And from a cultural perspective, it was also hard. But they were so overcome with the message that God had brought them, the bottom rung people, the invisible ones. God came to them first, the night of Jesus' birth, that they were overwhelmed that they would be sought out by the living God. So then they go to Bethlehem and they're like, 
This is really what God said. This is exactly the way he said it. He gave us his word. This is amazing that they couldn't help but tell people. These smelly shepherds who weren't supposed to really be interacting with normal society suddenly had to spill over and tell everyone they knew. And the miracle part was the people that heard the message that God had given them, well, they were responded and they were amazed that God would follow through on his word. And then the shepherds went back to their normal life, but they were changed. They had been transformed, and they had interacted with the Son of God, and they had watched God come to them and bring his word. So I want to encourage us, if there's a place where we feel invisible in our lives, God sees us. He sees us. We do not have to be invisible. We do not have to, to melt into the wall. God's word to us is peace and good will. He's not looking to shame us. He is not looking for us to rise to a moment of perfection. And if we are willing to seek out and go and follow through to find the place of the Savior, our lives will be transformed forever, even if we end up going back to the desert with the flock. Is this connecting? <laughs> Am I making sense? So my question for us is, will we seek him and invite him to transform our lives. The word here for peace, that the angel says peace, is irene, it's Greek. <laughs> and we, it's loosely translated Irene, which gives me a whole new respect for people named Irene because that just sounds like, you know, an old name from my great grandma's time. But it means a state of rest, an absence of strife. It denotes a perfect well-being. And Jesus, as the Prince of Peace, gave peace to those who call upon him for personal salvation. So let's go to the next slide because um, I just want to remind us, you are not invisible. God sees you and he loves you so much. And he sent his son Jesus for each one of us. His invitation is the same today as it was on the night with the shepherds. I see you. I care about who you are. I want to transform your lives. Even if it means going back to what you were doing before, you will be different. And your lives will never be the same. And everything you interact with will now be different. So <laughs> go to the next one. I think it's okay. So go back. Did you guys see the sheep one? Go, do you mind going back? To the shepherds. There we go. What do you call a herd of sheep tumbling down a hill? A lamb slide. <laughs> and then it says, you know, there's mutton like a lamb slide to cause sheer terror. <laughs> my husband is the king of dad jokes, so I sort of stuck that in for him and my brother-in-law, Stephen. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, this past week, Jeff and I had some business to do at the bank. Nothing too exciting because, you know, God is good, but we're not millionaires yet. And um, we were down in Roseville, and we were at the little cubicle, and we were talking to the account rep. And um, he gave us the info he needed, and we were chatting about questions. And the Holy Spirit whispered to my heart, he's, he's struggling in his marriage, and you should ask him about that. And so um, I don't know. I think I've heard other women do this too, but usually I'll check to see if there's a wedding ring on a man. And he had a wedding ring on, and it was worn. So I thought, oh, man, that's, that can't be right because it looks like he's in an established marriage. And the Holy Spirit was like, I, I want you to ask him about his marriage. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, so we wrapped up our chat, and I just said, um, we believe in Jesus, and we believe that he cares about everyone. And are you doing okay in your marriage? Is it okay? And he tears like spring to his eyes and he can't speak so we're all masked and he can't speak and he goes no that's part of the chaos in my life right now and he's like you're gonna make me cry and I said isn't it amazing that God loves you enough to send someone who doesn't know you to tell you that he cares more about your marriage than you do and we will be praying for you what happened in that moment God saw that man because we interacted with him and he didn't know who we were, right? Same as with the, 
the shepherds. And I think, guys, sometimes when we're wearing masks, it's easy for us to be invisible, right? It's easy for us to just do our thing. But what I want to point out is this was a scenario where we were all wearing masks, and that did not stop the Lord from telling this man he was not invisible. Those masks are not something that stop God from doing what he still wants to do if we're open to being people who are willing to speak peace and goodwill. And my question for us this morning is, are we willing to seek out the Savior in a way that overflows our lives so that it doesn't matter if we're masked or we're in the desert with sheep or we're wearing smelly clothes we've been in for 14 days around, you know, gross sheep? Because God is bigger than that. He's bigger than masks. He's bigger than mandates. And he wants people to know they are not invisible. And he sees them. And this time, more than ever, is so valuable because people are open and they're tender and they're missing places of connection. And I just want to say to you on the online campus, God sees you, you are not invisible, and he cares about the deep places that are going on in your life in every space, in every capacity. So we talked with him and just for a second because we didn't want to embarrass him and he was kind of He's actually on the point of his tears starting to overflow. And so we just said, we just want you to know that we care about you and we'll be praying for you. And we've been praying for him. He wasn't on our radar. (laughs) There was nothing there. And suddenly the supernatural became normal. The supernatural became normal. Peace and goodwill to everyone. The next story that I want to talk about is in Luke 2, 25 through 38. And for the sake of time, we won't read that. But it's the story of a man named Simeon and a woman named Anna. And in keeping with Jewish law, Jesus was taken to the temple at eight days old to be dedicated. And there he met two people in this story that at first glance sort of feels like a (laughs) drive-by. Um, we find out that Simeon and Anna are both aged. They're both well, well. Like, I was trying to figure out Anna's age last night. She was close. She was somewhere in her 90s. Um, And Simeon was also older. But Simeon was unique in that he had been given a promise by God that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah. And he had been waiting so many years, so many years, so many babies. I don't, I mean... (laughs) That's a strong word to not give up when you're at the temple day in and day out and you're like, is this the baby? No. Is that the baby? Oh, no, probably not. You know, but there's those moments, so many years, so many babies, but he remained faithful because he knew God would keep his word. And Anna had been married for seven years and then she became a widow and she served God for 84 years beyond that, giving us the understanding that relationship with God is more rewarding than any earthly relationship. So I just want to call attention to a couple things here. One is, with Simeon, God is always faithful to his word. Simeon waited and waited and waited. And maybe there's been a word that's been planted deep in your spirit, and you think, there's no way that could come true. The Lord told me that like 84 years ago, and that's a long time, Lord, and I know you live outside space and time, but I don't, and this wrinkle cream stopped working like 14 years ago, and people now know that I'm old, and I'm still waiting on your word, but Simeon trusted God, and God was faithful, and so I just want to remind us that God is faithful. He's faithful to his word. If he gave you something when you were six years old in your kids' church class and it hasn't happened, but it is deep inside you and you know that you know that you know that the Lord spoke to you, he's faithful and he will do it. So many years, so many babies. And then Mary comes in. What's his name? Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yes, This is the promise I've been waiting for. God's faithful to his word. And then Anna is such an encouragement to me because she is willing to not enter into a second relationship, not have all of the things that maybe her other peers had, but she's willing to say relationship with you, God, is more rewarding and fulfilling than any earthly relationship I will ever have. So I want to go to the next picture. Oh, Sorry, go, go back, please. 
right here. Don't you love this? Can you guys see this picture? This was a picture that I found a long time ago and I framed and then um, now I don't have it anymore. But that's Simeon holding baby Jesus. Can you see the watermark of the world overlaid on this incredible? And can you see the star reflecting? This is an incredible story because Simeon is literally holding God's word to him and God's word to the world. And I love that there are no drive-bys with God that don't matter, right? That, that word to Simeon is exactly what God knew in the timing that it would happen. And this is such an encouraging picture to me. Okay, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Um, and we'll read this part together. Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. And about that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. <laughs> and King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. <laughs> so... Um, I really think this is an incredible place because you have two very different responses. These three kings were great philosophers. They were very wealthy men. They came um, from, there's a little bit of uh, kind of conversation on when they came, but they probably came between when Jesus was 40 days and when he was 18 months. So that's what most theologians believe. Not quite two, but past the eight-day mark because the... Um, the sacrifice that Mary and Joseph gave for Jesus was like a low-cost sacrifice, and if they had come, they would have given the higher-cost sacrifice. So that's why theologians believe that he came after the 40-day mark of Jesus being alive. So these wise men were Eastern astronomers who studied the stars, and they observed this strange phenomenon, which was interpreted to them as a sign of the birth to the king of the Jews. So let's go to the next screen, please. Um... And the next one, sorry. Oh, no. Okay, let's back up. Did we miss the... Let's back up. One more. Keep going. There we go. Okay, this is the three wise men. Sorry, I just have to highlight all the dad jokes today, okay? So it says, we'll give him gold and frankincense. And the third guy is like, but wait, there's myrrh. No? Okay. I was like laughing out loud. So maybe it was just me and I was just enjoying like a dad moment. But wait, there's myrrh. I give you permission to use that all Christmas season with your uh, family. But wait, there's myrrh. Okay. So um, some believe these gifts that they brought speak of Jesus, deity and purity, the gold, frankincense, the fragrance of his life, and myrrh of his death, which is so cool because everything God does, you know, we saying you're perfect in all of your ways. And sometimes I feel like there can be a weight that comes on us like, oh, I can't, I can't live up to the expectation of perfection. I just can't do it. I have too many people in my life that are demanding that. And that is not what that's saying. It's saying even down to the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, God is perfect in all his ways. It means something because he's got that perfectly figured out. Not that we have to come to a place of perfection in our own life and get there. Okay, that was a side note. As my dad says, that was free. So what I thought was a cool side note, though, is according to a report from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, <laughs> say that five times fast, and Caltech, Jupiter and Saturn have been traveling across the sky together all year. Hey, 2020, some, some good news. But this month, we can get ready for them to really put on a show. Over the next three weeks of December, watch each evening as the two planets get closer in the sky than they've appeared in at least two decades, and some say hundreds of years. Look for them low in the southwest in the hour after sunset. And on December 21st, the two giant planets will appear just a tenth of a degree apart. That's about the thickness of a dime held at arm's length. This means the two planets and their moons will be visible in the same field of view through binoculars or a small telescope. In fact, Saturn will appear as close to Jupiter as some of the Jupiter's moons. So it will literally be like there's a huge shining star in the sky. Now, I just want to say, how cool is the Lord to put that in 2020? to highlight like he did in the midst of chaos in a Roman time for people in a faraway land, these wise men to come 
and show and highlight Jesus' life. He's doing the same this year. Hey, guys, 2020, I haven't forgotten about you. I still say peace and goodwill, and I'm sending a massive star to highlight the excitement of my son, the Savior who came to the world. So for the wise men, I wanted the point to be, (laughs) be willing to allow new observations to draw you into a place of acknowledging Christ's kingship in your life. The wise men noticed the change, and they were the, the earth's wisest philosophers. So they knew religions, and what caught their attention was that this was new in the sky. They had been studying the sky for decades. They understood this to be important, and that they needed to bring things that cost them something to lay before the king. I love what Henrietta Mears says in her Bible commentary, What the Bible is All About. She says, Christianity is a historical religion. The gospel does not begin with once upon a time, but starts with Bethlehem in Judea. There is nothing mythical. These statements are facts, and no critic or unbeliever can doubt them. Acts 10.34b says, I see very clearly that God shows no partiality. Partiality in here is the Greek word prosopoleptis. i got to practice my Greek. What's going on there? But it basically means showing favoritism or bias, treating one, enough, treating one person better than another. While society makes distinctions among people, God's love and grace are available to all, and in Christ there are no barriers. So here's my encouragement for us in this 2020 season especially is to ask ourselves how we're going to respond to Christmas season this year. Because if God doesn't show partiality, that means what was available then is available now. Because God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So my questions for us are, will we allow God to redirect our lives and handle the fallout the way Mary did? Are we willing to step into a place of saying, Lord, I know that you see me and I'm not invisible and you love me. Are we willing to be like Simeon and trust that God is faithful to his word always, even if it takes longer than we think it should? Are we willing to look to him for fulfillment that no earthly relationship can bring? And are we willing to allow new observations to draw our hearts to Christ's kingship? God does not, he doesn't play favorites. Everything he has and is is available to us. The other day I was at the park with my um, daughters. And my oldest daughter, you saw her up here. She likes to hang upside down on the swing. Has anyone done that where you like hang like this and everything's spinning around? And she said, Mommy, everyone is upside down. The world is crazy. And I said, No, baby, I think it's you that's upside down. And she goes, No, it's definitely everyone else. And I was like, Uh... So I just want to remind us, in this season, it's not everyone else. If there's things in our lives that are topsy-turvy, it's us. And the Lord wants to straighten out our our swing and set us on a right path. But the question I have for us is, how will we respond to Christmas this season? And will we allow, Stephen, you can come up, please, will we allow the Holy Spirit, to work in our lives to change history the way that he did at that first Christmas. Not because he's pressuring us. Not because he just wants us to be world changers. It's not that. We're not in a WWE competition. This is our destiny in Christ. And the supernatural is normal when we walk in Jesus. It means going to the bank and interacting with someone on a very small level and them finding out that God knows they're not invisible, even with the masks, even with all the things, even with COVID. So my heart to us today and my invitation is this. Let's enter in fully. We're, I'm, I'm a busy mom, we're busy parents, we're busy people, even with all that's going on. But don't forget that in the midst of the busy life when we have it all planned out is when Gabriel came to Mary. 
So I just want to ask you if you could close your eyes. And I just want to ask us to reflect. Holy Spirit, I pray that right now you would quiet all distractions in people's hearts for the online campus and people's homes or their cars, wherever they're listening. Now I'm going to pray a couple of things and I just want to invite you to pray them with me. Jesus, in this season, I recognize your Lordship and that you don't change. So my response today is I am your servant. Do what you have to birth through me and I will trust your word like Simeon pursue relationship with you over any other earthly relationship like Anna and bring you something that costs me something my life and I am willing to accept your peace and your goodwill and to stand in you and not to settle for being invisible. All right, now let me just pray over each one of us. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I thank you for this season that realigns our hearts on your love and your peace and your goodwill to everyone, no matter what is going on in the world. King Herod had the wrong response. He was intimidated that someone else wanted power over his life and his kingdom. May that never be us, Lord. May we always bow to you, and may we always be people who respond the way Mary did. If you're here this morning and you say, you know what, Carrie, I need to rededicate my life to the Lord and ask him to be my savior again and bow before him as the Lord of my life, I just want to invite you to do that. Will you just raise your hand and we'll pray with you? Thank you. And if you're online, just pray with us as well. And if you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior and you're like, what is this craziness you're talking about? It sounds amazing. I want to be part of that. Then come on. This is for you too. So if you've never asked Christ to be your forever friend, the Lord of your life, and to forgive your sins, and to walk in a new way, this is your moment. So if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. If you're on the online campus, I just want you to know that you can comment or you can message us. This, this is when the supernatural becomes normal, and it is the most exciting and fulfilling thing that can happen in our lives. So let's pray together. For those of us that are wanting to rededicate our lives, Lord, thank you that you came to earth as a baby so that you could die on the cross and forgive my sins. I rededicate my life this morning fully to you. And I thank you that you would be Lord of my life from now into eternity. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you to seal this time. And we thank you, Lord, for your blood. We thank you, Jesus, that you came as a baby. That's how much you trusted your Father God. You came as a baby. May our hearts always have the response of those in the Christmas story. And we just thank you, Jesus, for who you are and that you are faithful, faithful, faithful to your word. If there's anyone that would like prayer, I'm just going to invite you to stand and come forward. Um, We would love to pray with you, especially in this Christmas season. This is my favorite season of the whole year. Um, And if not, then we're going to take the offering as well. So come and bring that part of your life, if you want to, to the baskets up here. And... 
Um, I'm going to give it back to Pastor Lane. Thank you so much for praying with me as I got ordained today and just for honoring me in that way. And thanks for hanging out and listening. God has given us some incredible people to work with here. Well, we want to uh, give everybody a chance to, and I want to step up a little bit. We are, the next big project that we're doing here at New Song is we are mindful of the fact that, that our online campus is the new front door for the church, and by the way things are going, it will be that for some time, uh, and probably not going to change ever. We need to do something with lighting here. Uh, the board has uh, said that we should do that now and we should do the whole thing if at all possible. Uh, the latest uh, for, for the, the right lights on the front, the up lights, and the back lights is going to be about seventeen or $18,000. And so uh, we've got part of that. If you want to be part of that, just I'm, I'm just encouraging you this. If, uh, if God lays it on your heart, I know he's laid it on Tanja and our heart uh, to do something. And uh, I just invite you to, to ask him if, if there's something that uh, he puts on your heart. Ask him where the money is. Because <laughs> I'm not sure where it's coming from. I know the last time we gave, God provided for us in, a, in a, just a particularly uh, singular way that we would know that it was him and not us. And so I invite you, uh, the Christmas gift this year would be toward lighting so that we could do a great job, a better job on the, uh, on the online campus. So I, I want to say, how many would say, I need a miracle in my finances? Is there anybody like that? Yeah, yeah miracle in finances. How many just need a miracle in your life? Yeah, that's, there's a lot of us that need a miracle. Oh, my goodness. I want us to do this. I want us to, I'm going I'm to bless, bless you and bless the offering. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. I think I got it. Maybe not. Maybe I do. There you go. Or not. Yeah. Right. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for everyone that's... Uh, you know what, I pray this way. You are the one that's going to supply all of our needs. That is what you said. You would supply them for all of our family's needs, and you supply them for the family of God and the church house, or what is your house. You have a way of supplying that. You are not broke. Last time I heard, there was no recession in heaven. So I'm asking you, Father, to do what you let me that which uh, is a miraculous uh, occurrence in all of our lives. Father, I pray for the ones that need a financial miracle. Lord, I pray that a, a check would come to an unexpected place at the right time. I pray for raises. I pray for uh, side jobs. I pray, Lord, for increase. I pray, Father, in every way. And as we give to you, we don't give to get, but we give to honor you. So we say, Lord, please be honored. As we give to you today, because we love you, not for compulsion, or because we have to, but because we want to. And as you can say, we pray these things. Amen. If you're giving online, online campus, you'll go to uh, you know, the bottom of the page and it'll say, if you're going to click on that. Or if you prefer something, go to our website and follow the prompts on the home page there but when you go to the giving section. And uh, God will honor you for doing that. I want like us all to stand. And would you come this way with your gifts? For the, and if you're coming for prayer, would you just stay at the altar? If you want to do that? Want to pray for healing? Want to pray for, for the miracles in, in, in your life? If you need a miracle, I want you to stay at this altar. I don't want you to go back. I want you to come and stay. Will you lift your hands for the blessing? Father, I pray the blessing upon your hands. I pray that we would be blessed in our going in and our coming out again. I pray